So we're walking through this into this part that you know. So what's the history that, that you know about this place? Well, it's locally it's called Jail Park oh, because it was the rear end of the old prison that used to be here. And reputedly, many executed prisoners oh my God. are buried in these grounds. That's what the local people say, anyway. Do they? And what, what, what period was that? In the 1800s and maybe even 1700s. Oh, my God. So they used to execute people here? Yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. Well, we look into that history. So the work that you do, where did you get your sort of passion for the stuff that you do? For, probably that's a, a question for the psychiatrist couch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say <laughs> that, you know, look, looking back at my past, I grew up in a very devoutly quite extreme Christian fundamentalist family. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very similar to Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. I love that. You know, the Jeanette Winterson book. Yeah, that was brilliant. Her family depicted there is very, very similar to mine. Dude. So quite extreme, quite extreme. Yeah. But on the good side, they did give this sense of, you know, the importance of doing what is right. OK. That they, they saw that in religious terms, you know, do what the Christian calling requires. Don't follow the mob. Don't just go along with the crowd. Stand up for what you believe to be right. And of course, I translated that into a wider you know, social political context as well. Brilliant. So for me, um, from an early age, I was very questioning and skeptical. Um, very one to not just go along with what everybody else said. Was that innate in you, that questioning, or did you have like an inspiration from a teacher, or no. you just like, it was I, I don't your know. way being? I don't know where it came from. Okay, okay. It was just innate in you, just a gift from God for you to be like that. I wouldn't say a gift from God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, however it came about, you know, I am very untypical of my entire family. Yeah. No one else in my family has any interest or involvement in politics, yeah. human rights, right. community work or anything like that. They're just focused on the family and the church. Right. So how I end up the way I am, that's a bit of a mystery. I suppose I took elements of Christianity and sort of adapted them. So, mm -hmm. you know, the Good Samaritan. Yes. You know, yes. I am my brother and sister's keeper. Yes. Um, yes. You know, those basic precepts of love thy neighbour as thyself, those are rooted in Christianity yeah. in, in my upbringing, yeah. but also, of course, shared by other faiths and people of no faith. Yes, absolutely. So it's absolutely. rooted in humanism as well. In 1963, at the age of 11, I remember um, hearing about the bombing of a black church in mm -hmm. Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. where four young girls about my own age were murdered by white racists. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking at the age of 11, oh, how could any person kill another human being, mm. let alone four young girls in church yeah. on a Sunday morning? Yeah. Yeah. So that prompted my interest in the black civil rights movement, which of course I could relate to, given my Christian upbringing, because it was led by a Baptist pastor, Martin Luther King. Yes. So, you know, I became an avid follower of the Black Civil Rights Movement from that age onwards. Right. Okay, that's interesting. And if you look at my history uh, since and now, you can see that a lot of the ideas, the methods, the approaches yeah. I've sought to adapt yeah. have been taken from that, those tactics, those ideas, non-violent, direct action mm. and civil disobedience. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So my question to you, Peter, is what is love to you? What does that mean? I think love is probably partly about sharing mm. and partly about the basic idea of treating others as you would have them treat you. Mm. If you operate in that way, you are giving an expression to love. And then, of course, as well as that being on a personal level to a partner or family or friends, you can also translate politically and socially, to a movement for social change to end injustice. Mm, mm. Love is, to me, the single most important anchor mm. in all my human rights work. So it's only closed 1878. Now that you're an older gentleman, <laughs> <laughs> did, 
and you look back on your amazing history, mm. would you do anything different or do you think there's different ways of achieving the same goal or are you happy with the way that things unfolded for you and the way that you did them? Well, I'd say that pretty much the template was set down in my early teens, right. modelled on the Black Civil Rights Movement. Okay. And I've more or less stuck with that since. Right. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a universal set of principles, mm -hmm. which obviously need to be adapted to particular moments and historical or cultural circumstances. Yeah. But the, the basic principles are there and have guided me ever since. Now, I don't say that nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience is the only way. Nah. It's one way among many, but it's a way that many other people have been reluctant to use or haven't used. And so I've tried to use it where appropriate, yeah. not just in the battle for LGBTI rights, but yeah. also for other human rights. Mm -hmm. If I look back over my, what, nearly 50 years of activism, I can't uh, remember any single action I've ever done that I've been uh, totally satisfied with. Uh. You know, I've always thought, oh, I wish I'd done this or yeah. I should have done that. Yeah. And I am very, very hyper self-critical. Um, you Virgo? Which is quite destructive. <laughs> you Virgo? Uh, no. Oh, okay. No. Aquarius. <laughs> oh, okay. That's um, interesting. You know, it's... I, I often have post-action depression. Oh. Um, because I just think it could have been done better mm. or... That, that things could have been done differently. Mm. Um, I said that's sort of quite destructive in a way, but on the upside, it's always kept me very on my toes. Uh -huh. So I've never felt sort of smug and self-satisfied because yeah. I've always been thinking, well, it could have been better or I must do it differently next time. And that's helped improve and strengthen and develop my activism. Wonderful because I haven't sat back and been complacent. Yeah. And I do listen to my critics, you know. Some of them are quite harsh and some of them say some pretty horrible things, but uh. I think it's important to listen to your critics uh. because sometimes what they say is right. And sometimes if you listen, you can learn. Uh. Sometimes your critics can help you improve and be better in, in, in the ideas you espouse and the way you do it. Uh. I agree. Um, in terms of regrets, um, probably the biggest regret is that I didn't use outing earlier than I did. Initially, I was very much opposed to outing. I mm. thought, you know, it's, it's a person's private life, let them be. Um, it was an invasion of privacy. And it took like a long time for me to come around to the idea that there could be such a thing as ethical outing, mm. namely, outing someone who was a public figure, who was anti-gay in public, but gay in private. Mm. So it's the, it was the issue of hypocrisy mm. and homophobia that finally convinced me that in those particular unique circumstances, outing could be ethically justified. Mm. Mm. But I only came to that conclusion, you know, in 1994. And I wish I'd come to that conclusion maybe in 1984, <laughs> and perhaps outed, outed a few more you know, MPs and bishops who were leading the fight against gay equality, despite their own homosexuality. Mm. I remember when I first had sex with a man, thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing, this is wonderful. This feels so natural and so normal. So I never really had a problem. Mm. No angst, no you know, tortured self-doubt or whatever. Despite this incredibly strong religious upbringing, which, which saw homosexuality as being you know, one of the worst possible sins on a par with murder and rape, the proof of the pudding was in the eating, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I just felt totally at ease with it. And I thought, well, the Bible must be wrong. Mm, mm. So when I realized I was gay, of course, given my already awoken political activism, I wanted to do something. Mm. I wanted to challenge the homophobia. Mm. So I suggested to a friend, let's set up a gay rights organization. They looked at me like I was crazy. They ah. said, you know, 
What do you know? You're 17. <laughs> You'll get us all arrested. <laughs> Go away. At the very least. <laughs> Go away. So all I did was just, the only, I, the only thing I could think of doing was writing letters to local newspapers, you know, critiquing homophobia or criticizing homophobic reporting, making the case for law reform, because at the time, <coughs> in Melbourne, in the state of Victoria, homosexuality was still totally illegal. You could be punished with several years imprisonment and even enforced psychiatric treatment. So it's pretty grim. Um, initially, when I wrote those letters, I didn't dare sign my name. I was afraid I'd get a police knock on the door. But eventually, over time, I did sign my name and even my address. But I was very frightened. The appalling attacks you've had, Peter, like 300 times you've been attacked and going to Russia, you know, Mugabe and <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. And the physical things that, that have happened to you, like with your coordination and memory and all those awful, and not being able to eat properly because of that. So I want to know, because you were talking about being initially when you were 17 af afraid, how do you keep on going with, with after with such um, vicious attacks and abuse? How, how do you get up and go, right, I'm still going to stand up for what is right. I'm still going to make a stand for love. I'm still going to get out there and push myself forward. What, what, how do you do it, man? <laughs> well, that's a good question I often ask myself. Um, I guess, it, well, again, it's back to the old thing of putting myself in someone else's situation. If I was suffering, I'd want someone to step up to the mark and help me. Yeah. So when I see others suffering, and particularly when they're asking actively for help, yeah. I feel it's my duty with others yeah. to do what we can to help them. Yeah, yeah. So that's what drives me on. I also think, you know, at the end of the day, compared to human rights defenders in Russia, Iran, Uganda, I've got off very lightly. Many of them end up being killed or maimed, imprisoned and tortured. So, you know, in that sort so of sense... So you count the blessings, in a way, yeah. to give you the strength and inspiration. I, I put it in perspective. Okay. And when you put it into perspective like that, it makes it easier to deal with. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I can understand that. The, the left and right paradigm, mm -hmm. do, do, do you think it's, it's changed? What, how do you see the landscape politically? Is, is it a bit more complex? I think a lot of the traditional divisions between left and right are more blurred these days. Mm. So for example, I've worked in a coalition which has included people like the Tory MP David Davis mm. to mm. defend civil liberties and free speech. Now, he's a right-wing Tory. I disagree with him on most issues. But on this issue, he's been very good, and I've been very happy to work with him. Mm. Um, and I think there is a new sectarianism in left and green and progressive politics nowadays which says, if someone has once ever said anything bad, they're cast to hell. You should never touch them or work with them. Well, we can never make social change on that basis because all of us are flawed and imperfect. Um, there's something people, well, many things people will disagree with me about uh, and many things that I will disagree with them about. But if we can unite to oppose the poll tax or to oppose the bombing of Syria or to demand the repeal of racist or anti-gay laws, then let's work together. Work together. Mm. Let's work together. That's the only way social change happens, is if you're prepared to build alliances and coalitions, even with people who you may not otherwise normally agree with. Yeah, yeah. So if, if, you, if, you're, if you maintain and insist upon a political purity, you'll be a political purity of half a dozen, and you can't change society on that basis. Yeah. So in a way, what I, the feeling I'm getting from you, it comes back to what you were saying earlier about the love thing, love mm. or hate, and mm. actually coming from a place of love even to one's enemy, one's perceived enemies, mm. that you forgive them and you love them, and then hopefully mm. humanity can move forward. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, over the years, you know, you know particularly in the 70s, 80s and 90s, there were journalists who wrote really horrible, ghastly things about me. I know. But some, several of them, like Kelvin McKenzie of the Sun newspaper, have said sorry. And, um, you yeah, know, my attitude is thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm yeah. just absorbing the things. It would, be, it would be easy to say, oh, F off. Yeah. Um, too late now, mate. Yeah. But my view was, well, he had the courage to say sorry. This is one of my early achievements. Is it? What? In 78, creating this adventure playground. Did you? Well, me and the local community, but I was the chair of the local tenants association at the time. And this is all derelict. This is a bomb site for wow. the war. <gasps> really, really. Yeah. Obviously, you're, you're very well known for your um, human rights work, but you've also written recently about economic kind of equality. Human rights and equality don't exist in a vacuum. Mm. You know, we live in a society where the economy is probably the foundations of everything else. Mm. Um, you know housing, employment, social services, um, business, all these things exist around us mm. and they are the you know, fabric in which we live and which we strive to seek to secure equal human rights. Mm -hmm. um, for me it's quite clear that human rights affect people in different ways depending on the economic circumstances. Mm. So if you're well educated and wealthy, if you have some kind of injustice, you're going to have much better capacity and resources to fight that injustice. Mm. You know, now with the cutting of legal aid, um, you know, poor people don't have the same legal options as rich people who can go out and hire you know, a top class lawyer to fight their corner. Mm. Um, the same goes with the battle for equality and human rights. You know, you know, if you're funded by a big business organization, which has got billions, you're going to be, have a very effective, well-run organization. <laughs> Whereas we know that most um, human rights and equality organizations are funded on a shoestring because they don't have any big corporate backers, because they're not feeding into a, you know, a, a, an economic advantage that will benefit the very rich. The whole gamut is just so skewed in such an unfair way. And it's, and it's not conducive to social cohesion and yeah. living together and sharing. Yeah. It's, it's not about sharing. Our economic system is not about sharing. It's about stealing and grabbing and you know, taking for oneself. But why is that? What's at the root of that? The, 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 that? That kind of grabbing for oneself and not the sharing and not recognizing that an egalitarian society is actually healthier for everybody, including mm. The upper echelons. Why do people just want to grab for themselves? Is it because they're mostly damaged, spiritually bankrupt, or, or that's just the way well, they've been trained? No, possibly all of those things. <laughs> uh, probably all of those things, but also just because there's we live in a particular system, um, which a lot of people sadly believe is the only one possible. Right. They can't conceive of something different because they're being told all the time this is the way things are. This is the way things have been, the way things are, and the way things will be. So it's a narrative that's, that's being yeah, pushed through I mean, all the time. And the left progressive movement is often very weak at articulating the alternative, mm. and often not very clear about what the alternative might be. Mm. So at the end of the day, if people aren't being given a coherent, credible um, alternative... Mm. Vision. Then, yeah, a vision. Um, it makes it very hard for them to grasp that something different might be possible. So, what's your motto? Is it motto for life? Is that the right way of phrasing it? Do you have a motto? I've got a whole series. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, love is the beginning, the middle and the end of any true liberation struggle. Yep. I like um, that. I'm going to use that. Every successful social change movement is a collective one mm. but every really important social change movement is for the sake of the individual mm -hmm. and don't accept the world as it is dream of what the world could be and then help make it happen oh i love that that is brilliant that's wonderful <laughs> well it just summarises my philosophy, you know. I don't just think about what's wrong yeah. and complain about what's wrong. Yeah. 
I try my best with others yeah. to do what I can to help make it right. And you do. I mean, I know you, and I love the way you keep bringing in other people, and I think that's really right and fair. But just to say you have done a lot, and it's been really appreciated by a lot of us, and really an inspiration to a lot of us. So thanks, mate. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>